Russ Pate um, chairs a number of organizations and has written a lot in this area and has done a lot of research in this area. Uh, he's involved in the Institute of Medicine um, mid-course correction and he's also involved in a national organization that's providing guidelines for physical activity in children and adolescents. He's been involved in some of the Surgeon General's reports on physical activity, health, and well-being, and we're delighted that he's back. Russ serves as our external advisor in the area of health and fitness and well-being for Youth Next. We have an external advisory board, and um, Russ has been here on a number of occasions, and we're happy to have him back, and he's going to give the first overview presentation, Russ. Thank you, Art. Uh, really is very nice to be here. Uh, as Art mentioned, uh, I've had uh, many associations with UVA over the years and uh, have been here many times and I'm delighted to be back and honored to, uh, to have served as an advisor to the Youth Next uh, program uh, over the last few years. I'll begin with an anecdote that will date me, uh, uh, but uh, also show just how far back I go with UVA. Um, so when I was an undergraduate student, our track team used to come here and run UVA every spring. So I was here three times in the mid-60s running track meets. And uh, at that time, <coughs> Mem Jim, right across the street, uh, had a barracks in it upstairs where Art's lab is now. And it was a barracks that uh, visiting teams used to, used to stay in. So uh, I have the honor of having slept in Art's lab before he did, I think. <laughs> I know you've had naps in there, Art, come on. All right. Uh, so my job, as indicated on the title slide here, is to, to speak with you for a few minutes about the physical health effects of, of physical activity in kids. And um, frankly, when I was asked to speak on that topic, my first thought was, how am I going to make this interesting? Right? Because this kind of reeks of I'm going to run through the litany of, you know, good physical outcomes that are associated with, uh, with exercise in kids, <clears throat> and I am going to do that. I mean, that, that's clearly part of the job here, so I, I, I am going to do that. But um, I do think there's probably a sense that we know more about this than we really do, and so my fundamental message to you uh, it, on this topic is going to be, yes, uh, we know that, that there are very important physical health benefits associated with higher, uh, maintaining higher levels of physical activity in kids. But there are huge gaps in our knowledge of that relationship. Uh, they limit our ability, uh, I, I think, to uh, develop uh, uh, policies and practices and recommendations that, uh, that, that will ultimately be effective in benefiting the health of kids. And so I really have two messages. Yes, we, we, I think, do know enough about this relationship to warrant moving forward with, with public health action to promote physical activity in kids. But at the same time, we should not kid ourselves and, and, and behave as if this is, this is done science. We've studied this, it's in the books, and, and let's don't worry about it anymore. I don't think we're close to that point. Uh, I'm going to do three things in the next few minutes, give you a little context and background, some of which will, uh, will overlap some with, uh, with Bill Dietz's presentation. I am going to summarize uh, where I think we have reasonable science to indicate a relationship between physical activity and specific health outcomes in kids, and then I am going to point to uh, uh, what I think are some important limitations uh, in this science. As Bill pointed out, we have... Uh, uh, since 2008, uh, federal physical activity guidelines for Americans. And um, uh, that uh, set of guidelines does include uh, a guideline for kids. And in the interest of full disclosure, I, I, I served on the physical activity guidelines advisory committee and my job was to chair the subcommittee on uh, physical activity and health in kids. And uh, Bill recited the guideline to you, so I won't, but basically it is that kids ought to be active for an hour a day. And within that hour of activity, they should regularly engage in, in vigorous exercise, in muscle strengthening exercise, and in bone loading, bone strengthening. 
exercise. So an hour a day and then do some special kinds of activity <clears throat> within, that, within that hour. Uh, he also mentioned that uh, within the last year, uh, as, as really positioned as a mid-course five-year uh, update to the physical activity guidelines, a mid-course report, and uh, let, me, let me digress for just a moment, okay? For, I know Deanna will correct me on this, for at least 25 years, we've had federally mandated dietary guidelines. 25, thereabouts, something like that. Uh, we do not have federally mandated physical activity guidelines. We got guidelines in 2008 because Mike Lovett, who was then the uh, Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, decided that we needed them and mandated that they would exist. But there is no law that, that, that argues or requires that this will ever happen again. No, I think it will. <laughs> I think it will happen at the 10-year point. Uh, but uh, labeling uh, the, the physical activity guidelines mid-course report a mid-course report is actually an, an optimistic labeling of all of this because there's no guarantee that there will be uh, an update to the physical activity guidelines because it's not in law at this point. But in any case, uh, uh, the mid-course report was, uh, was released within the last year, and it really was not an update to the guideline. It was, a, in a sense, a build-out or an addendum to the guideline that, that uh, as Bill summarized uh, quickly, had uh, a set of recommendations on, uh, based on the science regarding promotion of physical activity in kids. And uh, since he did this in, in his talk, I won't take much time on this, but you can see that there are some approaches to intervening to increase physical activity in kids where the rating was sufficient evidence, uh, but there weren't many, right? There weren't many. Now, you would say, well, why? <laughs> We, we wouldn't really need federal guidelines on promoting physical activity in kids unless there was a reason to do it, right? So I'm pointing this out because I, I, the point I, I intend to make is we are behaving as if we know a lot about the, the effects of physical activity on health in kids. We've got a guideline that's based on that science, and we've got now federal guidelines on promoting physical activity in kids that, that wouldn't make any sense to produce if there weren't important health outcomes to be gained uh, by, by implementing uh, these strategies where the evidence was deemed to be uh, sufficient. Uh, when the 2008 Federal Physical Activity Guidelines were developed, um, uh, a quick decision was made by the subcommittee that I was associated with to not include a recommendation for kids younger than six. And, uh, you know, since, uh, uh, you know, a lot of my group's work over the last decade has been based in, in preschools and with three to five-year-olds, uh, that didn't make me really happy to have to do that. And Diane's going to talk with you in a while about, uh, about uh, specific approaches to promoting activity in the preschool uh, setting. Um, but there was just such limited science at that point that we really did not feel that we could credibly make a recommendation. Now, changing rapidly. Uh, I think probably not quite enough yet, but changing rapidly. Uh, we had an IOM report released a couple of years ago uh, that said toddlers and preschoolers should be provided with, quote, opportunities for light, moderate, and vigorous physical activity for at least 15 minutes per hour uh, while children are in, uh, uh, in care. And that's the equivalent of three hours of physical activity uh, over a, a period of 12 waking hours. And uh, since I was involved in developing this, I can tell you we were not aware at the time of uh, uh, very similar developments in three other countries. Uh, in Australia, the UK, and Canada, authoritative organizations were developing uh, very similar guidelines. The, the terminology is a little different, but it's, it's basically three hours of total physical activity per day uh, is now uh, widely recommended in, in a number of different countries for kids this age. So I'm going to now go back to the Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee report, which concluded that there were important health benefits for kids in, in a, number of, uh, a number of areas. And I'm going to tell you what those are and give you a little snip of the evidence that supported uh, those conclusions. And my point here is, is to address the strength of the evidence upon which 
some of these very important public health initiatives have been, have been based. So one, uh, one outcome that I'll have more to say about in a couple of minutes is lower body fatness. Uh, it was concluded that youth with higher levels of physical activity are leaner, and one of the studies cited to support that was the important work of Bob Guten done uh, a decade or so ago with uh, uh, high school, middle school, and high school age kids. He did controlled uh, intervention studies and showed that with uh, substantial expo exposure to increased physical activity, there were beneficial effects on, uh, on percent body fat and visceral adipose tissue. Another positive health outcome cited in the uh, guidelines advisory committee report uh, was in a favorable impact on cardiovascular and metabolic disease risk profiles. Um, one of the studies cited there was a Lancet article by Anderson and others uh, where they looked at the uh, metabolic syndrome cluster scores, sort of several uh, uh, cardiometabolic risk factors sort of considered in one index, found that kids with uh, higher levels of moderate to vigorous physical activity had better scores than inactive youth, uh, cross-sectional study. Higher levels of cardiorespiratory fitness. Uh, you know, you can consider fitness an exposure uh, or you can consider fitness an outcome. I think it's both, but uh, I think it's an important outcome myself in kids. And, um, you know, I'll make a little pitch here. Um, you know, it's been since the 1980s that we've really done a large scale national survey of fitness in American kids. And I, I personally think that that's absurd and uh, we need to get on the stick and do this and do it right on a large scale. Ann Haynes has recently completed a small, uh, a small survey of fitness in, in American kids, and that's important. It needs, to, it needs to have been done, but we really need the large scale kinds of surveys that were being done routinely uh, in the 60s, 70s, and, and 80s, but haven't been done since. In any case, uh, it, it is clear that higher levels of uh, physical activity are associated with better fitness in kids, cardiorespiratory fitness, and, Diane Ward, who's here today, and I have reviewed this literature two or three times and you know, find the same thing every time we look at it, which is kids that, that uh, increase their participation in, in, uh, in vigorous exercise benefit from it in terms of fitness. That's true for muscular strength as well, and Bob Molina and others have reviewed this literature, looked at 22 uh, experimental studies, and it's clear that kids that do resistance exercise get stronger as a result of that. And uh, uh, very important, and uh, uh, Chris Economist, who's on the program, has done very important work in this area, but increased bone density. Um, you know, frankly, if I had to pick one <laughs> outcome here that I'd say we really ought to be worrying about in, in kids, uh, this might be the one because, you know, this, this may be one where you pass a certain developmental stage and uh, it kind of is what it is at that point. So, you know, if, you, you know, if we want kids to, to kind of enter adulthood, um, having minimized their risk of, uh, you know, sort of negative uh, health outcomes, osteoporosis and others uh, later in life, then we'd, we'd better get them uh, bouncing, you know, as, as kids fundamentally. Uh, there was another category in this, uh, in this report, uh, which was sort of not, not quite as strong evidence, <clears throat> and uh, it was in the, uh, in the mental health area. Uh, Rob Model at uh, University of Illinois, one of the studies that was cited here as evidence that uh, kids can reduce their symptoms of depression and anxiety or the risk of manifesting those. My guess is this is one that's going to move into the solid evidence category the next time uh, guidelines are developed. Other countries have, have done this sort of review and uh, this is a little checklist of uh, the outcomes that have been cited by countries that have developed physical activity guidelines for kids. U.S. is the first column starting from the left, work across Australia, U.K., Canada. And, um, you know, there's a lot of overlap, not perfect overlap, but uh, quite a lot. Now, that's what I think we do know. Um, what are the limitations to this? Well, I think there are several important ones. Uh, the evidence remains very limited in kids under age six. Um, you know, everybody's interested in uh, activity and weight-related outcomes in young children. Uh, we've worked in this area. We've worked in our own data trying to understand this relationship. We've looked at other people's data. We've tried to review this literature. Uh, it's not clear, okay? It's not clear. It's a hard thing to study. 
you know, kids at that stage are changing rapidly. I think the cross-sectional data are almost meaningless. Uh, and I think the only way we're really gonna understand this is uh, uh, do the right kinds of uh, prospective longitudinal observational studies uh, that, that uh, I think will help us better understand activity and weight-related status in, uh, in, in young kids, but that work is needed, and I'll have more to say about that in a minute. Um, the influences uh, on, of, of physical activity on weight status, I think, are, are generally poorly understood, uh, not only in young kids, but in others, and I'll say more about that in a moment in closing. Uh, if you look at, at these various outcomes where the Physical Activity Guidelines Advisory Committee group concluded that there were important benefits to higher levels of physical activity, um, you know, that really is based on uh, very limited knowledge of the dose response. So a question would be, well, where'd the 60 minutes come from? You know, if you don't really know much about the dose response, you know, then how do you know that you ought to be recommending an hour of activity? So. I'm going to tell you a dirty little story here, okay, because I think I was in the room when you know, the decision was made, and it was in the mid-90s in the UK, and a group there had come together to, to really think about what should the physical activity guideline for kids be. And we were looking at all the evidence we had, and there was an adult guideline at that point of 30 minutes. We looked at 30 minutes, and that didn't look like it was enough. It looked like you know, it probably needed to be more than 30 for kids to, you know, to, to not be at risk of overweight, which was really the outcome that was, was being focused on. And, and, you know, that group just said, okay, let's make it 60. And that's become, that's become the default in this, in this field. And, you know, they're, you know the U.S. Got, kind of got there a couple of times with, uh, uh, you know, I think with, with um, you know, important uh, uh, guidelines recommendations. I think other countries have, have studied this uh, and probably have been reluctant, if they were honest with us, I think they would say that, well, they, were, they, they didn't have a compelling reason for it not to be 60, okay? And, and, and so they didn't really feel like arguing with the U.S. about it. And, and, uh, and, and so my point is we need to know more about the dose-response relationships here between physical activity and these health outcomes. And, uh, because as Bill pointed out, not a lot of American kids are meeting the 60-minute guideline. Now, if the 60-minute guideline is the right one, then fine, okay? Then we suck it up and accept that and do the next thing that we need to do to, to address the issue. But if the 60-minute guideline isn't the right one, then, you know, we need to tweak it and figure out what is. Uh, also, there are real design limitations in this literature, and Bill said this, and I agree with him. There are relatively few um, large-scale experimental clinical trials, and uh, there are relatively few prospective longitudinal studies with, uh, you know, with really good measures following kids for a long time. And uh, I'm going to finish by just pointing out some work that our group did recently, and that is we, we reviewed uh, every, every prospective longitudinal study that we could find uh, looking at factors that are predictive of excessive uh, weight gain or excessive increases in fatness over time and uh, you know, limiting ourselves to the prospective uh, observational studies. And, and this is what we found. There, there are really only two factors where I think if you look across that literature, there's, there's reasonably consistent evidence that there's a relationship and it is low physical activity and certain genetic uh, characteristics are reasonably consistently uh, associated with, uh, with excessive weight gain or excessive uh, increases in fatness. Uh, the evidence is very mixed for sedentary behavior, and I don't have time to talk about it this morning, but you know we're driving headlong at guidelines on sedentary behavior that, frankly, I don't think we're ready for yet uh, in the science. Um, you know, the, mixed, the evidence is mixed on diet, on various biomarkers, family factors, Physical, physical activity environment in the communities, and, and no conclusions were made about a number of other factors that are often thought to be important in this arena. So we need better science, we need more science, uh, and that's not an argument for not moving forward with uh, addressing the issue. Uh, I think it is clear that, that higher levels of activity are important for kids, uh, but uh, a lot more to learn, and I'll, I'll look forward to uh, your comments and questions. Thank you very much for your attention.